Welcome back to another Post Media Ottawa Senators panel. I'm Bruce Garriott, pleased to be joined today by two-time Olympic gold medalist Cheryl Pounder and TSN analyst. And Cheryl, as we speak today, the Senators are getting ready to close out the season, but I think people are already looking towards next year. And there are going to be changes. There are changes in every offseason. And one of the things I wanted to do with you today, and we've talked about it a lot over the course of the last few weeks, is go over the club's depth chart for next season. And when I look at, at the, the lines and defensive pairings, I think up front they need, need two things. Number one, I think they need a top six right winger. And on that fourth line, I, I think they need somebody on the left side. Let's talk about that top six. Number one, do you feel yep. it's a need? And then we'll go from there. Yeah, I do feel it's need. I feel like it's been a need for, for a long period of time. I think we've known what Norris and Kachuk and Stutzla and Batherson can certainly do. We've seen um, Formanton elevate his game. You know what Connor Brown can do as well, in particular on the PK and just that veteran presence that he brings. And now you add Matthew Joseph into the equation. And so I think we've seen his versatility, the ability to go really throughout the lineup, whether it's on that top line, second line, or into a third line role. And if Matthew Joseph winds up on your third line next year, potentially, I mean, you are in a very good situation, although I'm seeing him slotted in somewhere in that second line position right now, possibly one based on how he's playing. But if you look at the right side right now I feel like there is a hole there based on where Batherson plays whether it's like on the one or the two I think that there is a need right there as well because if you have your players playing the appropriate positions I see Shane Pinto coming back potentially with the Connor Brown alongside yeah. even a Formanton and imagine that as a shutdown line with speed that can be opportunistic. And I think you're sitting in a good situation. If you have a third line, that's certainly in that position, but you need, you need a top six, a bona fide top six with some veteran presence. And I think that'll just kind of layer the team appropriately. And I, I think one of the things that certainly has been talked about here, Cheryl, is maybe a possible trade for a guy like Minnesota's Kevin Fiala. Um, I don't feel like the Senators are in a position where they're going to be able to get a, 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 a an unrestricted free agent to fill that need. Do you think they're better off to go through trade? Well, you know, when you look at the, the the pieces that the Senators have, I mean, it would be awesome to be able to get a Fiala. You know, I know there's been a lot of talk about a Giroux and and the ability yeah, to get yeah. them in the, in the in the top six, right? I mean, you've got contract with white, you know, you look at Zaitsev, there, there are things that you can do or management can certainly do to attempt or try to bring these guys in. And I think that's going to be the big, big thing in the off season. You've got a lot of young talent on this team and they're just missing a few pieces. And so if they can get these pieces, maybe you're looking at, at a difference maker to start the season. And that is what's critical. We've seen a sense team that has done particularly well in April for whatever reason it may be, but they've got to come out of the gate flying next year because you don't want to be having the same conversation. And I think they really do have to fill that void with players like that um, because there, there is a little bit of a hole. You want to slot appropriate players into the positions that they, that, you know, they're best suited to be in. And I think that the, the, the Sens certainly know that they've got five pieces up, up in the top six that can, that can play interchangeably, but they need that six. And then what that does is it solidifies the third line. And I think those three lines are, are the real question marks. Of course, Shane Pinto coming back, you know he can be a 200-foot player. In particular for me, I know he's lost a year of development, but he is so smart. And he is a two-way uh, center that has the ability to support. And I was really impressed last year watching him. I kept saying to myself, wow, does the puck follow this guy around? And then I kind of said, Cheryl, give your head a shake. He's in the right spot. He's got a good stick. He supports the play down well, down low well. So I think, you know, you're looking at a guy in that 3C hole right now. Um, and, uh, you know, with opportunity uh, to move. But I think that's where we're seeing that, or certainly I am. It's, it's a matter of, matter of what's gonna, what are his flanks going to look like as well. And, and that really relies and depends on what's above, what's in that top six. And, and you brought the name up, and I think people here would love to see him as Claude Giroux. And just quickly on, on Claude Giroux, I mean, he come in, he could teach Tim Stutzel and Josh Norris how to take face-offs because he's one of the best face-off guys in the league, Cheryl. 
a uh, veteran presence. He'd come home. To me, he'd he'd be a perfect fit on a two year deal. Well, I I think you, you, everyone I think is is talking about the same kind of stuff. And I love what you said about the face off circle, because with Stutzel, you know, just over I think he's in around the thirty eight percent mark. And yeah, he he's not he's not mature yet. He's not physically mature. He hasn't been in the middle. He's going to learn. But if you want to keep him in that two C hole, you want to surround him and insulate him with someone that can take key face offs when needed so he can develop uh, through practice, develop within games, but in key say, face-offs, he can have someone come in and take it with, you know, depending on whether, uh, you know, DJ Smith wants to move him back to the flank, but I like Stutzla in the middle. I think he's in that two C hole right now, but I think, yeah, you got to insulate, you got to be able to align. So these guys can grow and what better than a veteran presence that is strong in those areas who has learned the tricks of the trade and can share that information and can win some key face-offs, whether they're in the D zone or the offensive zone, um, as the season progresses and watch uh, Stutzla and these guys progress in, in that position. Just real quickly on the fourth line left wing spot I left open you, before we got on here, you brought up a great idea. And, and I, I think because he's DJ Smith's type of player, you're right. I should just pen him in there is Parker Kelly on that left side of that fourth line. Yeah, and I think with the, with with the fourth line, you can cert, you have opportunity to play with these lines because you know there are going to be guys you know outside uh, of the twelve that have the opportunity to bump in and out of the lineup a little bit of a carousel if 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 you're watching them perform and play well. But really, when you're talking fourth line, you talk energy, uh, guys that keep their feet moving, they get back. Uh, you know, to present the uh, defensive structure quickly. They're they're trying to to eat up some valuable minutes, um, you know, to get some rest to to your top guys and I and, and allow for matchups. And so I think this is key. And Parker Kelly has shown that he's got you know that energy about him. Um, you know, he's had the opportunity to score goals early in his career. Um, so here's a guy who's got some skill as well. But when you when you talk about a Parker Kelly, you talk about sort of a you know, momentum changer. And I think that's uh, his ability right now. So I could see him on that fourth line as well. You know, I, I let's go to defense now. I have pairings right now of Thomas Shabbat, Artem Zub, Jake Sanderson, Travis Hamannick, Nick Holden, Eric Branstrom. I don't like that group in that, to me, even though you're bringing in Jake Sanderson – and Travis Hammock is relatively new. I don't think there's enough change there. And I don't and I'm not sure why I feel that way, Cheryl, but I, I think you also feel that they need to get another defenseman. Yeah, I, I still I still am of 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 the mind that and, and listen, I was a D. So so I put a lot of weight on D and in particular when you've got to protect the middle of the ice. And and it's really critical that you, you take care of your house, if you will, back in your own zone. Yeah. And and when I, when I look at this roster, I think Hamannick and, and Delzato are doing a fantastic job right now. I think they've been a consistent, steady, stabilizing force on the back end. I really do believe that. I just don't know if the sample size is large enough yet for a Hamannick. Um, and the one thing he does have going for him being a right, right? I think this is something that someone like Brandstrom has against him right now. You know, when, when you look at Brandstrom as a lefty, in your scenario, Bruce, playing the right side. Yeah, and when I talk, and he has he hasn't been good on that side. It's hard. He's a smaller defenseman. He's more of a skill zone exit guy who's going to quarterback one of your power power plays. He's going to try to use the middle of the ice, and so when you put him on his offside, it's harder to 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 steer the puck off the wall and just the control of the puck on those zone exits. It's not as quick as he's on his backhand, and I think all of those elements because he's not big play a role and. I'm with you. I don't think he's played a ton there. I think he's looked a little uncomfortable in that position. So just in the mere fact of what you have on the left, you know, I think Brandstrom is a question mark here. And you look at power play production. Yes, I think he quarterbacks it well. Um, he's not a shot threat. But when you look at point production, it really isn't there. And you look at, you know, I think he's got nine assists or something, you know, a couple goals. But when you look at someone like, what, what does Brandstrom have? Yeah, he's got, so he's got nine assists on the season. Uh, but when you look at someone even like a Zub, you know, he's got six and 15, right? Yeah. So it, it, you got to sort of weigh this. And so I certainly have the mindset, you know, I, I know you're, you might dis disagree with me, um, Bruce, but you know, you got a Lassie Thompson and yet you have some, some young players that are also there, but I still think they need that, that veteran, solid, consistent presence, yep. presence that you, you know, 
has performed. Um, and, and that's something that I, that I think is certainly big. And, and you look at Sanderson, I mean, if he is even remotely close to what the expectation of what he's done in college and what everyone knows he can do, I think you're looking for partners to be able to complement Shabbat yeah. and Sanderson. I think you need partners that allow them to be the players they are, not them playing for someone else, someone playing for them. And in that, you get the best out of them. And so who is, who are those partners for Shabbat and Sanderson? Because they are going to be the cornerstones of, yep. of your back end. Um, and, and certainly I like Zoo, but, but again, I'm still kind of looking for that, you know, wh where else do we go here? Um, and, and again, I've been a fan of Zelzato and um, Hamannick uh, as, as partners now because they're not just afraid. Like, they're, they're veterans. Hey, if I got to get it high hard off the glass, let's so be it. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> that's a learned a, sometimes that's a learn skill. And I'd like to say I make, made a living out of it, but I didn't really make a living <laughs> playing hockey. You beat so, me to it. <laughs> yeah. You beat me to but it. But it's, it's um, a skill. Yeah. It, 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 no, uh, no depth chart is complete without goaltending. Um, yeah. I don't know if Matt Murray's going to play before the end of the year. Uh, the hope is that he will, so he has some peace of mind going into the summer. Uh, my take on all of this, Cheryl, is the days of Matt Murray being handed anything are over. When he comes into training camp next year as a $6.25 million goalie, he's in a battle with Anton Forsberg for the number one job, as he should be. Yes. Yes, when you look at what Forsberg has done, uh, I think it's a great it was a great signing contract. Um, you, you see what he has done, in particular, even in even the games against the Canadians. He's, he's making the save that is needed to change the momentum in a game and to weather the storm. And when you walk into a game or you're in a game and you know you have that it, between the pipes, that sort of level of consistency, I think it just adds a, an air of confidence uh, from your entire team. But for me, it's managing and weathering those those stretches where your team is under siege and just getting your legs set uh, underneath you again. And that happens not just with, you know, veteran teams, but also with with young teams like like uh, the Ottawa Senators. So I think it's a pivotal piece. And I think and Anton Forsberg has certainly stood tall in the net. You've got Mad Sogard uh, underneath. I mean, huge body, huge presence. But, you know, if, if Forsberg can continue to do what he has done, um, showing the confidence and consistency in his game, you know, it's going to be a, a tough situation for Matt Murray to, to, to reclaim that position. Yeah. And I do think, you know, just quickly here that, that Philip Gustafson will be the odd man out yeah. one way or another. I, I, you know, he's on a one way contract next year. He can't keep three goalies. He won't get through waivers. I could see him being traded in the off season quickly. Yeah. I, I quickly, I, I have some departures here. I think okay. that Michael Delzato has put himself in a position where he can be dealt in the offseason now and go play for somebody. And that make room for some of the younger defensemen to be depth players. Tyler Ennis and Chris Tierney uh, are, are unrestricted free agents. Uh, I, I totally I, – I don't see any scenario where they're back. I'm not sure – I would bring Gadet and Gambrell back for depth. I'm not sure they will, but the two – Two people I want to focus on because they are tough to move is Colin White and Nikita Zaitsev. Now, the Senators were close to a deal with Montreal at the trade deadline for Colin White. Um, and his former agent, um, Kent Hughes, is a general manager. There was going to, I think, in the end, there was going to be some money problems where uh, the, the Habs didn't want to take on some salary. Do you revisit that and then... Let's go th quickly through him, and then I want to talk about Zaitsev before we go here. So let's start with Colin. Yeah, White. I think you have to revisit it. I think you know that you've got uh, Pinto coming coming back into the fold. You've got Ridley Gregg uh, underneath, and it's it's less about necessarily you know what Colin White is is bringing um, in terms of relative to the contract that he's holding and the money and in, in that contract. And so I think that plays a big role into that. I don't know what your thoughts on that are, Bruce, yeah. but no, I agree. That, that's totally. a hefty price uh, if you're paralleling it to sort of what the what what the value in it is. And so when you're looking at guys like 
you, you know, the top six or the, you know, the, the sixth place for the, the extra man that uh, I think the senators are looking for in their top six and how that will push everyone down. Where does that leave Colin White? Um, I think, you know, to justify the money, I think it's they've got to look to they've got to look to let it go. And the same thing when you talk about Del Zotto, I mean, I could see a situation here. And again, this is just us conversing right now. I haven't s sat there and thought uh, explicitly about it, but in terms of a Del Zotto and a Hamnet, could you see them as a third pairing if you brought in a top four? I, I think I think they want Hamnet to play with Sanderson. I do, and 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 that's just mm. me, you know. And so yeah, I, I think their bigger issue, Cheryl, is how do you move on from Nikita Zaitsev, and, and I think he's got two years left on a de on his deal at a lot of money. Uh, I don't have the salaries yeah. in front of me, but how. How yeah. do you move on from him? That's not going to be easy. Do you package him up to Arizona with a draft pick to try to get them to take on the money? Well, this is where uh, Pierre Dorian's got to be creative. And and you see the creativity and the different elements that can come out, uh, you know, whether it be at trade deadline or uh, in the summer. These are these are not easy to to do. Not easy to do, but when you when you look at this decor as as a whole, it does make sense to try and be creative to move Zaitsev. Uh, you look at the numbers, you look at the pieces of the puzzle, you know what Zub has done for you and brought over the last year and a half. I think he's really turned a lot of heads in the ability to play with Shabbat. You see that there's a level of comfort there. Um, with, when Shabbat comes back, Zub is physical. He has the ability to find shot lanes. I think we're starting to see a little bit of his offense. And when I mean offense, I mean just from activating from the blue line, getting shots through to the net. Um, so really comfortable with that. He's been a, a wonderful ad and, and someone that I think they've seen develop. And, and I think it's been a, he's been a big piece and reason as to why there's a question mark around this. You've mentioned Hamannick. And, and now, again, the, the question underneath is if they're going to bring someone else in. It just it just makes the most sense to to see both White and Zaitsev get moved. But the creativity, uh, Dorian's going to have to be creative and, and figure this one out. OK, Cheryl, last question. If they get the two pieces we've talked about and get some goaltending, can they push for a playoff spot next year? It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough just if you look at, it, at the division in itself. I think no matter which way you slice it, this team can can push can push for a playoff spot if they get the acquisitions that they need. But you need the best out of all of these guys. You're going to need the best from the beginning of the year. You cannot get behind the eight ball you can't come out and you know get one win in your first 10 or whatever it might be you have to play like they play down the stretch typically and i understand there's less pressure and there's all of these other things in april but i think these guys they have a belief in a culture and that's what i'm seeing again i don't know them like you you do bruce you're in the building much more than i am but i feel like these young guys certainly know their skill set they they believe in it and now i think they need the organization to show that belief in them and go get them some key acquisitions. And if they get those key acquisitions um, to steady them, to provide a little more consistency, to teach, um, I think they're putting themselves in a much better position. And if it's not next year, it is just that. It, it, you're looking down the road with the hope and the understanding that, hey, we can do this. And I, I think that's the biggest thing here is you want to enter a season and say, hey, you know, we got we have a potential shot at it. Not like it's yeah. going to happen, but we have a shot. We're not. You know, this isn't going to be a lost season. We have a shot at it. And I think that's what they where they have to put themselves because these guys are going to develop over the course of the year, another year. And then it's that following year. What are you looking at there? And so for me, it's a few years, but I think you have to enter with the, the belief that this could happen. And these guys have to play like they believe it. Okay, Cheryl, before we started, uh, you said you gave a, a, a speech yesterday and you dug into your sock drawer and brought out a couple <laughs> of your close friends. Can you show your close friends to us and explain? Oh them? yes, I can. They're right here. So this is my Olympic gold medal from 2002. All yeah. right. I think so I covered my... your only hat trick, right? When you beat the hell out of those poor Italian women, right? No, that was that was this one. That was this oh, one. Oh, okay, sorry. And I didn't quite get a hat trick, Bruce. I tried to go end to end for the third, but it was seventeen <laughs> nothing. I figured I probably shouldn't do it. Um, and then that that's the ribbon. Like, yeah. Oh my God. So everyone always asks me, you know, what's what? What the hell is that? 
And I say, that's the ribbon to the medal. And I always say that's the journey, the ups and downs. And yes, uh, the celebration afterwards uh, was quite fun. I wore my medal for two weeks, didn't take it off but I've shared the medal uh, quite a bit. And I always say that's the journey of, um, of a team, right? The ups and the downs, and that's kind of what it looks like, but it makes it the greatest, the greatest victory. So um, yeah, hard to believe that was so long ago and I'm ancient now. Yeah. We appreciate your time today, Cheryl, and you're the only guest we have where Elizabeth, our producer, doesn't give me the 10 minutes. You're at 10 minutes, so you can stay on as long as you want. We appreciate yeah. your time. That's the Post Media Ottawa Senators panel. I'm Bruce Garriott, pleased to be joined by two-time Olympic gold medalist Cheryl Pounder, also a TSN analyst. Thanks for today, Cheryl. Thanks, everyone.